I had the absolute pleasure of talking to triathlon coach Dan Atkins today. He is the Gold Coast Performance Centre coach down on the Gold Coast in Australia, and you can now call him an Olympic and Paralympic coach. So he looked after the likes of Matt Hauser and Jazz Hedgeland, and in the Paralympics, he was a coach for Lauren Parker as well as Katie Kelly and her guide Brianna Silk. Dan will do anything for his athletes. He only wants the best for them, and he always puts them first before his own needs. I had the pleasure of working with Dan on the Gold Coast looking after the GC MPC group when I was the sports dietitian for Triathlon Australia. He is fun and full of life, loves him a bit of karaoke. And today I've talked to him about his experiences going over to Tokyo for the Olympics and Paralympics and a bit of insight into what happened on the ground. Dan lives on the beautiful Gold Coast with his tolerant wife and three beautiful girls who he's excited to go and see shortly. So let's get into it. Welcome to the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast, the show designed to serve you up evidence-based sports nutrition advice from the experts. Hi, I'm your host, Taryn, accredited practicing dietitian, advanced sports dietitian and founder of Dietitian Approved. Listen as I break down the latest evidence to give you practical, easy to digest strategies to train hard, recover faster and perform at your best. You have so much potential and I want to help you unlock that with the power of nutrition. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast, Dan Atkins. Hey Taz, how's it going? Oh, so good. I'm so excited to talk to you, Dan. And, you know, I feel honored that you're speaking to me from the comforts of quarantine. Yes, comforts of quarantine. Look, I guess it's a process of what I've been through. I knew what I was signing up for going to both the Olympics and the Paralympics, but pretty stoked it's over. And um, actually, believe it or not, stoked I'm into quarantine now and I can sort of sit back and reflect on what's been over this five 10, 15, 20 year journey to to be here. So for people that don't know who Dan Atkins is, shame on them, but for people that don't know who you are, can you give me a brief background about who you are and where you've come from and how you got to be in hotel quarantine off the back of the Olympics? I'm a triathlon coach, a high performance triathlon coach that works for Triathlon Australia, which is our national governing sporting body for um, high performance sport. And I've worked in that role uh, for eight years, which you were a part of very early. That's, that's obviously evolved from what was, I guess, ideally a development program. But I also called it, in my own eyes, the Target 2020 program and in inverted commas, perfect vision, which is what 2020 is. So I was pretty proud of that little catchphrase. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had a target in... 2014 to have representation at 2020 Olympics. So I guess that's come off. Obviously there's been some ebbs and flows and and running a program like that is very much a roller coaster. There's no other word for it. But very fortunate that we had four athletes plus one reserve in Tokyo across both the Paralympics and the Olympics. And that's just been a really, really long journey with five, six actually pretty remarkable humans. Started way back as a swimming coach uh, about 16 years ago and started doing learn to swim and teaching little kids the art of swimming through to, you know, where I am, where I sit right now. But interestingly, I I still call myself a development coach and I don't ever want to stop, I don't think. Happy to learn from anyone and anything to keep moving forward. That's what's so great about you, Dan, is that you're always open to learning new things and you're never one to you know, say that you know everything and you're the best and all that sort of stuff, like maybe internally, like, yes, I'm the best, but you are so open to learning and, you know, putting your hand up to saying you don't know. It's awesome. So the athletes that you got to work with or have worked with that were at Tokyo are the likes of Matt Hauser, Jazz Hedgeland, Katie Kelly, and Lauren Parker. Yeah. And, um, uh, Brandon Copeland was there as a reserve at the Olympics and 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 also Brianna Silk is is Katie's guide. So up to this point I've been coaching Brie full time as well. So it's you know, having having all those guys there at the one uh, the two events is pretty pretty special for me. Yes, amazing. I'm sure you were very busy on the ground too. 
you know, people say to you it's a circus and that's probably the perfect word for it. But it, it reminds me of, um, you know, when you put a mouse on one of those spinning wheels and, and he's running as hard as he can and he has no real idea where he's going or what he's doing. That's just what I felt like the whole time. You were you were just – and even frantic in the lead-up. The three weeks before the games was the busiest I've ever worked and I didn't think I could work any more than I do. But um, – yeah, it was just chaos, really was the whole time. So, you know, and I'm just proud that I got them onto the start line, all the athletes, and they're all healthy on the start line, every single one of them, in a way that they were physically capable. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that I, I got them there and then left them to do their job. I want to ask you about what the, it was like on the ground. But before we do that, I think people have no idea – what goes into the Olympics and for an athlete's journey to get to that start line. So can we go back however many years we need to where that preparation did start for Tokyo 2020, you know, ended up being 2021 trying to do Olympics in a global pandemic, but what was the pre stuff like to get to Tokyo? If we talk about what we did in the lead up just to the Tokyo event itself was, you know, it was probably three years in the planning, obviously an Olympic journey is four years however after the first year after uh, Rio 216 so 217 I sort of sat down uh, with my little team and I said I think we've got the cattle in the yard to be able to try and produce something here and try and get people on team on the team and 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 it was sort of laughed at a little bit even by my own team but knowing uh, Matt and Jazz, Katie, and and obviously I started working with Lauren in two seventeen, uh, two eighteen. Sorry, so it was a little before her. Uh, I just really had this thought that we could do something quite special with this program. And the biggest hurdle for me was keeping them together, keeping them with me. I guess so. I had to reflect a lot on how I coached and what I was doing to to try and keep that unit together. But as it got really close, there was a lot of heat strategies that we had to to put in there. I'd been to Tokyo every year since 2018, just scoping out the course, checking the weather, the location, little things like how far away we could stay. At that stage, we were staying out of the village. Obviously, through the pandemic, we had to stay in the village. But so we were working on, you know, little things like how long did it take me to run, not walk, but run from the team hotel to race site? if someone forgot something in the hotel and you know any triathlete whether they be juniors age groupers olympians they're that you know no offense but you tend to all be scatterbrains before the race and that's where a coach does his best work to control that that stuff and i've often been on the start line of major start um, races where athletes have forgotten something or some goggles are broken or, you know, they forgot their gel or their electrolyte and I've had to run like a madman. So I, I really focused on Tokyo for myself and I had to be really fit and conditioned. Um, so little things like that you had to take into consideration where all the turns were on the bike, how, how many little rises they were, what gradient they were, just things like that. Um, but most, the, the most important part was how to acclimatise them to the, the demands of competition because – in 2019, when we did the test event, we were not good. And uh, I came away with that with a lot of knowledge on how I felt we had to prepare. And for the better part, I thought we did a really, really good job. It's a nice segue into an episode I did a couple back where I gave people a race pack list. It gives you everything that you need for the swim, the bike and the run and stuff you might need before and after the race as well. That's all there detailed so that you can just tick it off every time you do a race and then not forget something because the number of times I've seen athletes forget pivotal things like a helmet for a race is insane. So if you haven't listened to that episode and you want to go and listen to it, um, the link to download the race pack list is dietitianapproved.com forward slash race pack list. So some of the preparation that they had to do for heat acclimation, can you walk me through some of the, that process, how long it takes, what's the physiologist's role, what sort of things did you have to do to prepare for Tokyo, which was always destined to be hot? Where we're based on the Goldie, our Gold Coast, we're very fortunate that the, the conditions that we, we knew were going to happen in Tokyo, we were living in that through our summers. So so obviously January, February, March, April tends to be very hot in the Gold Coast, very humid. So we were fortunate that we could 
you know, and I have this real belief, it's probably more the art of coaching rather than the science, that the more you're in that sort of environment, the more you adapt physiologically. And with that also comes with understanding your nutrition and how to obviously fuel the body pre, during, and post. And I invested a lot of time in that area just to try and make sure the athletes gave themselves every possible chance to be able to perform. So the old Formula One car mentality that if you haven't got the right fuel in, you're not gonna you're not gonna perform at your best. So that rang true for me, and we we really worked hard at at the athletes understanding for every drop of sweat they lost, they they were leaking. I love that word, leaking energy. And for me, that was going to cost them somewhere in the race. So two nineteen, we you know I I stuffed it up. We went to Utah. We trained at 2,000 metres and had a ball of a time. The athletes came out and raced really well. But then we went from there to a place called Miyakojima, which is an island, which was hotter than the demands of Tokyo. And I thought, yeah, I'm just going to harden these guys. They're going to be so robust come the test event that nothing's going to hurt them. But I basically just stuffed it up because they were exhausted. So I felt when we went home that our preparation in the lead up to the Olympics was going to be based around aerobically conditioning the athletes in the Gold Coast winter or the, the, the autumn into slight winter, but do all our really, really hard sessions in a heat chamber. But I knew that with, with our physiology team of um, uh, Avish Sharma, who's our Triathlon Australia lead, who's, who's done a, P, a PhD in heat acclimation and, and altitude training, so he was the best person to get on board. Um, and Sean Dioria, who's our QAS lead physiologist who helps me with load and conditioning management. Um, so both those guys had a real important role in playing and how to plan it out. But at the end of the day, it was my decision how to do it. And um, I had a heat chamber set up in my garage, much to my family's disgust, and had this tent there and 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 whacked her up to 37 degrees. Um, but more importantly, it was the humidity that we had to prepare for because if anyone's trained in Queensland, they know – or Northern Territory, well, not so much Northern Territory in summer, but certainly in winter, that the humidity is what hurts you, not necessarily the ambient temperature. So we had to acclimatize, you know, to getting really sweaty and, and dealing with that. But the dovetail of that is understanding, again, as I mentioned earlier, that, that nutrition was as important as the work we were doing. So you know, I had up and goes. I had protein shakes in my fridge just ready to go as soon as they got out of the heat chamber, just just refueling and obviously doing the sessions in there. You feel quite sick um, stomach-wise after the session, so you don't feel like stomaching anything, but I just like forcing it down their throat. Come on, come on you've got to get this back in to recover. So that was a big part of it as well. But it was probably – two six-week blocks that we we did that in the lead up with a couple of weeks in between off doing it to recover. When did you do those two six-week blocks? It was just as we were coming off summer. So it was like April and we finished some racing then, which was really good and we had an easy week. And then we just did some, you know, some little snapshots, I might say, of it. We didn't necessarily get it at 37 degrees, but we were just sort of doing some harder sessions in and amongst the, the, the middle of the day or um, we were sitting in the spa, um, which is a really good way to heat acclimate. And then the second block, well, we went to Cairns after that and in, in June. And so we got a little bit of heat in our system and, and obviously some good humidity early June. And that was, that was where we knew what the final team would be. So that was an exciting period. When did the athletes find out they were going to be Olympians? What date? For me, that was probably as exciting, if not more exciting, than actually being at the Olympics, being that Matt and Jazz both found out on Monday the 21st, I think it was, of June, and uh, which was exactly, well, they're about four weeks out from the Games. And I knew it was the day they were going to find out, and I just couldn't. Me being me, and you know me, Taz, I'm, I'm, I can't sit still. And I, I said, no, I'm going to walk home. So I left my car at the pool. I decided to walk home, and then Jazz rang me, and I was just screaming the top of my lungs. I was that excited. I was just – I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I honestly didn't think she'd make the team, but we had such a good plan around how to make the team, and, and Jazz really took it on. And I'd felt she'd done enough and, and obviously the selectors thought that as well. So that was, 
for me personally was a real highlight and um and then about an hour later Maddie rang me and we had a really cool moment but he was and this is probably the special most special part of it for me was he was more excited that Jazz had made it that we'd had two from our squad this little development program that you know, eight years ago we were told you'll only be development. You'll just tell, just have under twenty threes and juniors, and and now here we are, and we're still, I think, a development program, but a development program with Olympians and Paralympians. So yeah, it was pretty cool. That's testament to Maddie's personality, though. Too, he's always you know thinking of others, and he's quite humble. Yeah, he he's a very uh, he probably won't like me saying this but he's a very emotional big man like a teddy bear he is COVID's not good for Matt in the sense that he's a hugger and I love his hugs because I'm a hugger too that, I'll, I'll tell you a little thing what we did that night because we weren't allowed to say anything about the team because it's all under embargo and it just so happened we were having a team barbecue that night everyone was at the team barbecue looking at each other going have you found out have you not found out we're trying to be really quiet and I asked Matt and Jazz to come up to my room and and uh, we popped a bottle of champagne in my room and we were screaming and hugging and uh, we were crying and, and it was just such a nice moment. And, of course, everyone heard us downstairs and they're like, well, we know what's going <laughs> on here. Yeah, so we sort of gave it away. But, again, the, the squad and the program and the, the, the staff and everybody felt a huge part of it and I, I tried to make them feel a huge part of it because every person played their role in getting those athletes there and, for me, steering that bus, I guess, as the head coach, it was just, uh, it was just a really nice moment. And nice to reflect on that too. After working with someone like Jazz and her sister Kira for forever, like how long have you known Jazz Hedgeland for? Well, I moved to Perth for a role in 2013. Honestly, I say this wholeheartedly. Jazz was part of the reason I went there. She was an exciting athlete. I'd worked with her at the Youth Olympics as one of the star head coaches and, and there's just something about her that when the role came up, 20, 30% of the reason I went there was to try and work with someone like Jazzy. And, you know, it's just one of those moments that you just knew you had to do it. And I didn't coach Jazz when I first got there. And it was Kira, her sister, who has this, she has this amazing my, a characteristic that she just doesn't take no for an answer. And she was this little 15-year-old and she basically said to me, what are you doing over here if you're not coaching? And I said, well, I sort of need a break from coaching. She just didn't take it. She went, no, nah, no, nah, you've got to start coaching me. And, of course, Jazz went, well, if you're coaching her, you better coach me. And so that's how it sort of started. And, and you know, the first session I did with Jazz, I just went, well, oh, this kid's got this tenacity that is really rare. And obviously she moved to the Gold Coast with me and, and I, I reflect on even that and go as a 17-year-old, letting your, ch- your child go across the other side of the country, trusting them with me, you know, who they'd only known for less than a year effectively, like that, that's massive for a parent to do that. And I've got a 15-year-old, I'm not sure I could do that, but they did, the parents. So they're a huge part of it as well, you know, the parents and and I'm sure there's not an Olympian or, that was in Tokyo that didn't want to have a support network around them like Jazz has and and uh, and myself. So, yeah, so 2013, 2014, that was when we first started. Let me know if this sounds like you. Do you feel exhausted by the end of the training week? Do you crave sweets in the afternoon and feel like you need a nap? Training for three disciplines can be absolutely exhausting if you haven't dialed in your nutrition. It can be frustrating when you can't quite piece together the solid race performance you know you're capable of, and confusing when there's so much information out there, but you're not sure what's the right method for you. My goal for you is to unlock your true potential and feel like a supercharged triathlete. Firing in all cylinders, full of energy, and not only smashing quality training sessions, performing in every race too. If you're finally ready to start nailing your nutrition, Join a powerful community of like-minded athletes in the Triathlon Nutrition Academy program. Head to dietitianimprove.com forward slash academy to check it out now. For less than the cost of a coffee a day, you will finally have a plan for your nutrition instead of winging it and hoping for the best. It'd be so hard because the Olympics is not the Olympics. You're trying to do the Olympics in a global pandemic. You know, so much uncertainty, Everything was last minute, you know, to know that you're racing in that biggest race of your life four weeks before it is, 
there's so much to get your head around of that and then traveling through a pandemic let alone towing the start line ready to race it'd be very challenging yeah it was it it was there was a lot of things that we had to do I, i think at the airport coming in we had we picked up like nine pieces of paper had to have all these apps filled in like um OCHA it's called, which is like a COVID questionnaire that you had to fill in every day for 14 days beforehand and the mountain of work. And then you had to train for this event. And then you also had to focus on the biggest event of your life. And that's why I always felt a sense of relief when I got them on the start line. I'm like, oh, they're there. I can't do anything else now. But I must admit the AOC and and Triathlon Australia did a great job in, in giving the athletes every possible chance from that area, you know, to try and keep them centered on the job but it was impossible impossible to not avoid getting caught up with COVID and and the fact the games have gone ahead and the fact that there's been so many remarkable stories is is just phenomenal I want to know all of them that's what I do at the moment I'm sitting down watching interviews at the Paralympics and interviews on coaches post the games that have been successful and and um, I just love listening to that stuff because I'm like how did you do it because I want to know the answer. Just on that COVID and travel stuff, when did you guys like have to get your vaccinations? Did you have, well, one, did you have to get your vaccinations to go to the Olympics? It was for the Olympics. It was different to the Paralympics. The, the Paralympics, they made it mandatory unless you had a medical reason, which there were some, but they insisted that you had both shots of the vaccine as well as flu shot. The AOC heavily advised it and obviously triathlon australia said no we we want you to do it and to my knowledge there was no one that didn't do it so we had our, and we had um exemptions from the government based on the fact that we were going to japan so so matt and i got our first shot on the 10th of may and uh the second one on the 31st of may so we were i guess in the scheme of things quite early on but um yeah very thankful that we were able to do that and equally thankful that neither of us at this stage have or any of us have had any you know COVID problems or or anything so but um if it wasn't for the government allowing us to do that I'd yeah that would have been a very stressful period. So what was it actually like when you got to Tokyo what was it like on the ground? Well first things first getting off the plane it was it was just Wow, you're getting ushered everywhere and there was, you know, we were warned it could be a one hour, uh, sorry, a three hour to eight hour process. Um, but it's very smooth. Uh, the one thing I'll give the Japanese and the organizing committee is, is as far as having an event through a global pandemic, I'm honest that when I say this, I don't think anyone could do it as well as them. They were so organized, so many volunteers. You, you could not have put a foot wrong as far as trying to work out where to go. And then, you know, three hours, you had your first COVID test there and you had to wait till that came back negative and, and obviously that all came through. So then you go on a bus and you go into the village and, and when we got to the village, being triathlon, you're there quite early. So there's, there's, it's quite calm but um, and you're ushered straight to your team hotel, which is one of, you know, 32 buildings or whatever it was there in the village. And, and we, we had a fantastic um, area there, which was sort of overlooking Tokyo Bay and you could just sense the the security presence was there with the coast guard all around and it was excellent you felt very safe uh we could run around the village which was a 3k radius but obviously for us early on it was all about the race and getting ourselves right and getting the athletes in and the girls traveled a couple of days after the boys just because their race was a bit later so boys and myself and a couple of the other staff sort of had got a bit of an idea of what to do where to go and things and um look it the dining hall was as exciting I guess as it probably got for us we were able to go there once a night once a day and just eat and you know I'm just in awe of Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes you just they're just fittest humans on the planet everyone's ripping everyone's the same sort of confidence when they walk around and uh, I, I have to stop myself because I'm a real people stalker. So I <laughs> tend to just stare at someone because not you know, I'm just in awe of them. And, you know, I saw Djokovic having some run-throughs with Kipchoge one morning and, and, you know, seeing that was just unbelievable. You know, seeing the athletes and famous athletes 
blending in together and feeling comfortable with each other was probably the coolest thing. And all the Aussies getting around each other at the events and we'd sit outside and, and watch all the events was just just awesome. It was really cool. Pinch yourself almost. Absolutely. Pinch yourself. You look down, you see the Olympic rings on your chest and, you know, it's very, very cool and something I don't take for granted. With the actual race, with the triathlon race for the Olympics, the televised event was shithouse. Like I had no idea what was going on. I guess I had a sense in my mind of what the game plan might have been. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about the race or what happened. And I'm not going to tell you what my game plan is because I'm sure you already know what it is. But yeah, what, what actually happened in the event? Because it was really hard to see sitting back here in Australia watching on TV, like what was going on? I guess the first thing I'll say with that is, is that I felt as a team, the one area we couldn't control and we didn't execute well was we hadn't competed internationally that much. I'm not going to use that as an excuse because a lot of the other countries were in the same boat, the Kiwis, who had a fantastic campaign, I felt. But for me, I just, we just it felt rusty. Certainly the boys' race, all three got through the race and um, all three of them reflected and were disappointed for their own reasons. I mean, I know Matt particularly was just stoked that he finished and, and so he should be. He finished 26th and battled his way through it, cramped on the, bot, on the run and, and things like that. So, you know, I look at that as a coach and go, well, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? But the strategy was, was pretty simple. It was get in the race and, and protect your run. Uh, basically, and how we did that was totally up to the athletes in the race. And and look, Jake Jake rode really well and was there. They were all there. All three boys were there. So it came down to the run. And and um, I can only speak for Matt, but um, it it just was honestly. I felt he was tired before the event. We had such a big lead up. Uh, they raced really hard in Port Douglas four weeks out, and 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 then even three weeks out, and honestly think the conditioning he had his best race was in Port Douglas, which is probably hard for people to hear when you go, well, how do you not get up for the Olympics? But you, it's not a matter of about mentally getting up. It's physically your body's got to actually respond on the day and getting it right. And I think uh, for me as the coach, I look at it and go, that race was probably just that bit too hard for him four weeks out from an event, a major event like an Olympics. So that's my own challenge now is to is to work out how to do that better and sort of help my athletes through that so so yeah obviously we were a bit disappointed with how everyone did in the individual and and I don't think that's secretive or anything like that but and as far as the girls tactics there was none really it was just again like the boys get in the race and race hard and and triathlon Australia wanted everyone to finish we want you to finish we want you to be there to to, to be in on TV and represent Australia, your coaches, your staff, your, your family, your friends, and do your country proud. So that was sort of our tactic, I guess, was to, to do Australia proud. And, and I still felt they gave what they had on the day, which is all I can ask for. They all did amazing. They represented their country so well in such an adverse situation. Like that's hopefully never going to happen again for athletes to – be given the call up so close in a really hot environment and traveling into a race in a global pandemic. Like hopefully that never happens again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all living it and that's not lost on us that we are privileged enough to travel to a country and, and to, to race. And then I've heard a thousand different interviews with athletes just saying how privileged they feel to be here. And we've all got to understand that this, the, going through an Olympic journey is is bigger than I ever could imagine it would be. It's more intense than I've ever worked. Um, it's more intense than I've seen my athletes go through things. And they'll be better for the experience. And people that know, know how hard it is. Whether it's a pandemic or not, um, it just adds a different complexity to it that I don't think anyone was prepared for. And we sort of just tried to get through it the best way we could, I think. I was so proud to see Jazz, you know, the likes of Jazz and Matt who I've worked with personally over the years, like front up to the Olympics. How cool is that? So proud. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you coach juniors and you see them as little kids and, you know, they've got no idea about what's going on in life and now they're, they're adults and, and, and at the Olympics um, and I'm with them even more so is something I'll cherish forever and 
um, I'm sure they do as well. It's been been pretty awesome. And so you got to hang around after the Olympics and you stayed on for the Paralympics where you worked with Lauren Parker, KK and Bree. What was that like compared to the Olympics? Was it any different? Like what, yeah, what was the kind of mood like? What was it like on the ground for the difference? It only came through probably two weeks before going to the Olympics that I would be staying for the Paralympics. Uh, so for me personally, that was even a stressful period because I'd worked with Katie Kelly since the week after Rio, basically, when she won the gold medal. So it's been almost five years that I've worked with Katie and uh, I've worked with Loz since, you know, 218. So very, very long journey for both girls and, and Brie, we've worked together for three years. So I knew all the girls really well and, and all three had said to me, we really want you there. And that's all I needed to hear. And I knew that me fighting, which I literally had to do fight to say, no, I need to be here. I need to be on the start line next to them and I need to hug them goodbye and wish them well and tell them no matter what, I'm proud of them. And and so two weeks out, I get the call. Yep, you can stay. We don't know where you're staying, but you're staying and but you can't leave. So I was hoping I could come back and finish their training camp in Cairns with them, but they said, no, it's safer for you to stay in Japan. And then I'd hope to go to Canada to be with my other guys doing world titles. But they said, no, you've got to stay here. So I was very fortunate that um, Paralympics Australia supported that. And I was one of only three coaches that got to do both Paralympics and the Olympic Olympics and Paralympics. So again, something I'm really proud of. But um, yeah, they put us down this little town, two and a half hours south of Tokyo, and we just holed up for another 16 days before the event. And so I'm sort of used to what I'm doing right now in quarantine. I've sort of got an idea of how to manage myself and get through it. And uh, So that was quarantine for you, those 16 days down there? You couldn't go anywhere? We're allowed out an hour a day, effectively. So we could go and – so for me, that was great. I could go for a walk or a run or both and um, allow me to, to just get outside. And that, that got me through. But, yeah, we were there 16 days. There was a team of probably 20 Australians that were crossing over the both. And um, we weren't allowed to eat together. We weren't allowed to interact with each other really at all unless there was something you had to do with uniforms or doing documents or whatever. But it was a long time um, and it seemed to drag on there and certain times. But I just stayed busy. I made sure I kept in contact with everyone back home a bit more so and, and, and just made sure I made it all about what they were doing. And then how was the experience racing in the Paralympics? What was the racing event like compared to the Olympics? Very similar. Obviously, the and, and I'll, I'll say this firstly, that anyone that doesn't think our Paralympians don't put as much effort in as the Olympians, well, then they've got no idea. But these guys put everything into their preparation. They put everything into their day. Like Katie Kelly doesn't work effectively. She's a director of her own charity which is remarkable. Um, Brie has a business that she has to manage. Um, Lauren's a full-time athlete. So they are so fixated on that event. I know every one of my squad was watching Katie and Lauren's races and they were asking for messages through the race and so forth. So, you know, that's awesome for me. And they felt really proud of the girls of what they achieved and, and as I do. But look, on the ground, it was very similar. It was a bit tighter. Um, Paralympics Australia had a little bit tighter restrictions on things like going to the dining hall. They fed us in village, which was just exceptional uh, and especially how hard they worked. So I was there the week before the game. So I helped set up a bit. So seeing the operation set up a Paralympics for, for a nation is massive. Like just a bit of trivia. How many sets of scissors do you think it takes to run a Paralympic Australian team? 64, <laughs> 64 sets of scissors and 46 staple removers so they they just left no stone unturned and the feel for me around the Paralympics was sort of um somewhat better in the sense that that they just love what they're doing they just you know whilst the Olympic athletes are so much more in the know or in the in the spotlight and you're seeing Novak Djokovic walk around or 
Kevin Durant walk around because you can't miss him at seven foot four. But these these Paralympians, I put on the same pedestal, if not higher, because they are just exceptional people. They all have a story. They blew my mind with some of the things we spoke about. And and you know, I spoke to Dylan Elcott and and you know, he's just an ocker bloke that loves a yarn and made the emotion he had after his semi-final was just I've never seen anything like that in sport. He basically told COVID where to go, which may or may not be right, but hugged that young fella and it just oozed emotion. And I was just so, so proud to be of a part of what's called the mob and everything the Olympics was. For me, the Paralympics, it was almost a better experience. One of the things that a lot of people won't know or understand is that previously, as in pre like three days ago, the Paralympians didn't get anything for winning medals, but... ScoMo's maybe come to the table and he's going to change that. Yeah, it's been announced three days ago um, that uh, there was a bit of a public uproar that people were coming to realisation that Paralympic medals weren't equal as far as government funding to to the Olympic medals. And look, to be brutally honest, not a lot of countries do it anyway or do do it, but I'm really, really proud of the fact that our government has actually acknowledged that and gone, you know, And I honestly think through COVID, everyone's watching it. Everyone's watching the games. Everyone's seeing the passion in these guys. And and, uh, I think everyone would agree. Yep, they need to be on equal terms. And, I mean, the word itself, Paralympics, para means parallel, so equal to. And that, to me, is is what the government has realised and gone, you know what, we can't can't turn away from these guys. You know, Dylan Olcott's currently crying on TV because he just won the gold and I felt a part of that emotion talking to him and, and seeing what it means to these guys is it's everything. And the the fact now that they're getting the same sort of funding for medals is just, just brilliant. It just really is. It's going to get a dozen kids into this and, and they're going to look back and they're going to mention this in Brisbane 2032 and say, you know, it was that moment that we realised the government was supporting us as equal to the Olympians that got me into it. So that's fantastic. I love that, the word parallel. Like it just sums it up perfectly. A lot of people may not know that, you know, the funding for Paralympic sports is often a whole lot less. So for athletes to even get to where they are, to the Olympic level, they have to do a whole heap of self-funding themselves just with local races or national races to even get to that point to start with. So it is such a long slog and a, a can be often a harder journey to get there for the Paralympians. Well, without a doubt. I mean, they, they have all impairments that they need to manage as well. So Lauren's in a wheelchair, Katie's a VI athlete, so a vision impaired athlete. So there's all these things that they manage just day to day, you know, just life. I mean, imagine trying to ride a bike at 45k an hour with your eyes closed. Imagine swimming in a lake with your eyes closed without legs or you know, the capabilities of using your legs. Like it's, it's, I, I forget about that sometimes. And cause I don't see it anymore. I don't see what's holding them back. I just see them as athletes in front of me wanting to do their very best. And that's, that's what I try to deliver to them is there is no restrictions on what you're doing. Cause you're right here right now, which means you've got an opportunity to give it your best. And that's just how they want to be perceived as well. And, They are just remarkable people. I've learnt so much from them over the last three weeks and I've just been a huge thrill to see see the differences in all of them from all around the world and see how they work and and it's just just blows my mind. And KK puts so much sort of faith, not faith, but, you know, Brie does such a fantastic job to lead her through that race. Not even lead her. She's, She's not allowed to lead her, but... All of the logistics that people don't see for her to even get to the start line, for her to, you know, even get there and pack her bag and get the bike sorted, all those sorts of things is a challenge when you can't see 100%. So the the guides do a fantastic job there and Bree's still got to be that fit. Bree and I worked out early on that I had to coach her sort of full time as well and and that made it easier for me to manage. So I managed it in threes. I managed it, Bree and I, then I managed it, Katie and I, then I had to manage it as a team. And 
there was conversations I was having with Bree that I wouldn't have with Katie and Katie that I wouldn't have with Bree and probably those two having conversations about me. So <laughs> always, that, always, but it's a selfless role. So you basically got to commit four years or three years like it was for Bree without a lot of return on your investment. And if Katie's having a great day, well, then you got to match that. If Katie's not having a great day, then Bree's got to wear that and accept that. And, you know, it's, it's been a really interesting period for myself because the, some of the things that Bree's done has really challenged her. I'm sure it's made her a stronger or more stronger than she already was to take the role on. But I just knew when we talent search for the guide that there was something about Bree's characteristics that was going to work with Katie and her easygoing nature, but her toughness, there was a toughness there that I felt Katie needed that was quite internalized and it was just a great partnership and I'm going to miss it. I'm going to, it's a huge hole now that Katie's decided to pull up stumps and, and, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily lose just one athlete. I I lose a a team. So yeah, it's, it's quite sad to think about that, but uh, it's been a, a huge thrill for me to work with both girls. She's had a fantastic career, KK. How how old's KK now? I don't know if she'll mind me asking or saying on on this no, podcast. Well, she's the same age as me, and I'm forty six. So there you go. I won't tell everyone her age. Part of her reason for walking away, I believe, is the, the competition's getting better. They're getting younger. They're faster. They're, there's more information out there. Coaches are getting smarter. You know, winning the first ever Paralympic gold medal in para triathlon is history. She's a history maker. She'll go down as a legend in Australian sport um, that'll never get taken away from her. And whilst unfortunately she wasn't able to replicate that here, her gold medal performance was just getting on the start line at 46 and competing for a country and and doing it with, you know, a remarkable person in Brie was, was so cool. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so proud of both of them. Me too. Her and I have had some conversations in the past about her going long course. So we'll see if that comes to light. She's already talking about all sorts of things and I'm just going, okay, Katie, yep, no worries, that sounds good. But she's, you know, I've always said, you know, to be an Olympian or Paralympian or even just high-performance athlete, you've got to, you're a warrior. And when you walk away from, warriors always look for the next war. And uh, Yeah, you can't get her to sit still ever. Nah, and, and she shouldn't. She's got to look for the next thing to commit physically to and, and uh I've just made her promise me that she'll look after herself and, and you know, she made me promise that I'll always be in her life and that's that's definitely going to happen. Um, I'll be her number one fan. I'm so jealous. I am. I was sitting here in Australia just jealous. Look, oh, the support from home is, honestly, if we didn't have COVID, people wouldn't be up to date with everything as much as they are and, and I know there's a big backlash with us going and and the Australian community, you know, through COVID, how can you do it, all the money that goes into it. But seeing Australians do their thing and and everyone loves a champion or everyone loves a battler, you know, whether they've done well, whether they haven't, some of the interviews are just, oh, so raw and honest and you only got to think about who's at home supporting you and it just breaks you up. And... And if that's anything to go by, it just shows how much the athletes and myself want to do it for more than just us. We, there's you know, 26 million people we're trying to do it for and, and there's nothing like the support of your own and we've felt that. I can't keep you still either, Dan. So what's, what's next? The funny thing is after the Olympics and it, you know, we all know it wasn't great. It wasn't where Australia wanted to be. Australia – wanted us to be better, we wanted to be better, and we're all the first to admit that. Uh, I think people were worried to actually reach out to me afterwards, and it took people almost five days to start, you know, it was like they were tiptoeing around, are you, are you okay? And I'm like, I've never been more motivated. I walked away from the Olympics just going, I know what it takes now. I can see it. It's so glaringly obvious in front of me what it takes and it's pretty simple. We've just got to be better. I've got to be better. I've got to learn more. I've got to listen more. I've got to challenge more. I've got to ask 
you know, my favorite what if questions, what if we do this or what if we made that or, you know, I've already started that. The passion I have for wearing the green and gold, I wear it every day of my life. You got it on right now. Got it on right now. Still contracted to PA to wear it, so I've got it on. I didn't bring any other clothes, Taz. I've, I've got one Hawaiian shirt, one Hawaiian shirt that I wear for a vish and myself. That's our thing, and I'm sure when we catch up, we'll wear it. But uh, it's a consequence of being in triathlon. But I, I'm just so proud of it. I mean, I wear the coat of arms on my heart. Like, how good's that? It's not lost on me that so many people we wish to be in my situation, but also say, be careful what you wish for. You will have learned so much by being there. You know, like all of, the, all of the learnings, just being there on the ground and seeing what's going on, you can only get bigger and better from, and build from that. So, and you're open to that, which is great. Well, you have to be. I either pack up my stumps and carry them under my arm and go home or I, I come away from here motivated and I honestly can't wait to get home to see my family, my friends. I, I miss them so incredibly much. But I also can't wait to get back to work, and that's scaring me a bit. Like, I went for a walk one day around the village, and uh, if you follow me on Strava, you'll know that I'm the local legend around the village because I've been there You've for got so the bloody KOMs. long. You've KOMs? But I, no, I'm <laughs> not the KOMs. I've just got bloody local legend because I've run around that goddamn thing so many times. But uh, a lot of it was on my own. Did you set up the segments on Strava or were they already no, there? No, they were already there. Oh, <laughs> I so did, good. I did, I did go looking for them though. But um, <laughs> oh, who doesn't love a bit of self-promotion, a bit of self-accolade? Everyone does. And if you don't, you're full of it. I, I'm a bit scared, to be honest. I'm a bit scared of how I'm going to go home and get into it. I, I, need, I need to be calmed down a bit. You need some karaoke. That's what you need. I bloody need some karaoke. So if anyone's out there that would like to help me with that after I get out of quarantine, I'm happy to go on a road trip, do whatever it takes to, 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 to do some karaoke. Doesn't mean I'm good. I just love it. Come up to Brisbane and I'll do karaoke with you. Okay, deal. I'm terrible. I cannot sing, but I will do it for you, Dan. Excellent. Happy to. I love it. Not going to go home to Katie and the girls. You're going to come straight to Brisbane and do <laughs> karaoke with Taz. I think you'll get divorced, mate. Yeah, I would. I would definitely. I'll do. I'll, I'll bring Katie along too. She can sit there and shake her head at me like she does 90% of the time. What are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do? Other than like obviously go home and see your family, what's the first thing that you really want to do after coming back to Australia, being away for so long and being in quarantine for 15 days? Besides see my girls and, and hug them and hold them really hard, like really hard. Um, a little bit of squeezing, a bit too yeah, hard squeezing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to cook a steak on my barbie. <laughs> so Australian. I wanna, with my Cuba on, um, I want to open my beer fridge. I want to – I've got a really cool barbecue set up. If anyone knows me, they know my barbecue set up is great. I want to check my lawn out. I want to <laughs> have a look at my lime garden. I want to – I have I have this thing on Thursdays where my next-door neighbour and I have beers with the boys on bin day. And I think that could be a good podcast. <laughs> so every Thursday we put the bin out and then we have a beer. I miss that. I miss that. Coming home, put the beer out, beer with the boys on bin day. How's that for a title? It's the little things, isn't it? You do take it for granted, and I go away a lot. Um, I'm away effectively probably five months of the year, and that's a long time for people to go, I just couldn't do it. I think of the people in the army and, and, or mining or whatever, and, and, you know, they do that for their jobs as well, and, and families, you know, have to manage that, and it's hard, and it's hard for our family. Um, this job's very lonely, you're on your own a lot, uh, but knowing that you've got things to look forward to to come home to, that that keeps you going. And for me, I'm going to go away for a week with my family. It's my father's 70th. My wife and my father have insisted I go on a holiday. So we're just going to go up to the caravan park in Coolum and I'm just going to chill out with my girls and, and my family and, and um, stoked looking forward to that. And then I'm just going to get back into it. That's just what I do. 
I'll see who's there to come on the journey with me. I'll, I'm, you know, um, I'll get home and we have to reassess everything and everyone with athletes. I've been away a long time. Lots have happened at home. Lots is going to happen once I get home. And, and I just got to see who's there, who's ready to get on the bus and come, come on another journey with me. What a lot of people don't understand is that, like I'm not going to talk about politics or funding or anything, but sports that get a lot of gold medals get a lot of funding. And so if you don't perform, then your funding is limited or, or reduced. And so it's really hard to then get back into that limelight and get sexy, you know, get all the gold dangling medals because the funding's not there. And so I've had this conversation with a lot of like triathlon Australia providers, you know, physio and things like it makes no sense that if your sport is not performing to the level that you think it should or it deserves to be, then the funding should be more, not less. It makes no sense. Like how how is a sport going to get ahead when their funding just keeps getting cut and cut and cut? That's the brutality of high performance sport. That's you know, I've been uh, the back end of contracts and it's coming up to 10 days before Christmas and you're not sure whether you've got a job, they're pretty dark times, pretty pretty hard times to manage. There's not a single person I um, blame or hold accountable to um, those sort of decisions. I, there's so many hoops to jump through and, and, and policies and things to get right that it's just – like I wouldn't want to be a politician at the moment in Australia. I mean, you think about everything that we've been through, floods, fires, COVIDs, um, and then a little piece of good comes out of it when when Scotty M bloody announces we're getting some funding for some Paralympians to get them through. Like that's just, that to me gives me hope that the world's going to be okay eventually and we're going to get on with it. But, I mean, for us in, in triathlon, I don't know what the next six months look like. I, I, I don't know, but I, a lot of it I can't control either. Like I said, I've just got to go home. I've got to sit down. I've got to see who's with me, who's ready to go again, who's who's pumped up like I am, and, and just focus on them. My core business is athletes. That's what I'm all about. That's what I do. It's when I get distracted from that that, that I, I'm not good. I'm not comfortable. If it was just coaching athletes, I'd be as happy as a pig in mud. I honestly would be rolling around in it all days going, I love life. But high performance sport, there's a there's an element of your role that you've got to do things that you don't necessarily want to, but you have to because you're accountable to so much. And I've got to turn up then to training and be ready to to give my athletes what they need. And sometimes that's not anything. That's not a single word. It's just there's a session, let's go. Other times it's sitting down and having a heart-to-heart with them about something outside of sport. And they need energy from me to get through that. So where we sit now for the next six months in triathlon, I'm not, not sure, but I trust that we've got the people in place to manage that out and do the best by all of us. And I'm just hoping that I've got a piece of a, a place in that system and you know, my contract is till Paris. That's never happened before. They've never gone from one cycle to the next. I've normally had to go home from something like this and fight tooth and nail for it. So the fact that I can go home and I can have Christmas with my kids and not have to think about shit, should I buy those swing sets or where's our next food bill going to, how are we going to pay for that, school fees, all that. Like that's that's where I've been sometimes and I don't often talk about that because if I do, it's taking away from my core business, which is athletes. But that's the realisation of what we go through and to me that's nothing compared to what a lot of Australians have had to go through in the last even little period now and it's not lost on me how hard it is right now for everybody you should be so proud dan and all the athletes should be so proud of their performances they got to toe the start line in the olympics in the middle of a pandemic like i said it before it's a testament to their character and their spirit and their like grit that they went out there and smashed it and did the best that they could so i'm so proud to sit here and you know have been involved with them not in this lead up, but in the past to, to go and see athletes that I've personally had some uh, dealings with to go and do that. It's going to be the highlight of their career, whether they won or not, it doesn't matter. They still got to go out there and, and smash it with the best in the world. Yeah, absolutely. It's strange because when you get there and you're on the start line, it's the same people you race normally week in, week out. There's no one new. Uh, it's the same, same group of people, but it's everything in the lead up to it that, you know, from, from working with you 
a few years ago to to um, you know the people we work with now to you know it's not lost on me that there's so many people that's gone into this and I know the athletes over time will reflect on all this and every now and then they'll see a glimpse of their Olympic shirt or their Olympic suit and actually feel proud and it'll make you feel a bit taller and and that's why I, I'm hugely honoured that I get to wear it every day of the week my Australian colours and you know I just love what I do and I'm bloody want to go again oh brisbane 32 i said i'd retire after 2028 and then as soon as brisbane was announced katie looked at me and just went i've lost you for another four years after that haven't i and i'm like it's brisbane it's my home city hometown oh what a way to go out there will be karaoke that year and look out look out brisbane (laughs) we're coming (laughs) Prep the karaoke now. Prep the karaoke. I'm going to bring the whole team there. We're going to be doing it all night. Everyone's invited. We've just got to wait 11 years. That's all right. It'll go quick. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today, Dan. I know that you're coming to me from, what, day one of quarantine, so I've hit you up early. Thank you for being so honest and open and having a chat through what our Olympians faced over in Tokyo. Oh, thanks, Taryn. I really appreciate it. I wouldn't have wanted to talk about it with anyone else. So there you go. Number one podcast, hopefully, after this. Anyone else wants to be on a podcast, give me a shout. You know, happy to <laughs> talk about karaoke, singing, um, beers, steak, pool cleaning, anything. Or track Cricket. Anything. Cricket. Oh, bloody Broncos. Oh, maybe not them. No, I'll talk about the Broncos. <laughs> but thanks, Taz. I've really loved it. It's been great. You're welcome. I, I wanted to leave you with one final question. If you could go for a long ride with anyone, anyone in the world, who would it be? Two people. My mate, Kerry Wilde, who's just passed, and probably probably my, my grandfather, who, who basically was there from the start for me and pushed me all the way. He, he never rode a bike, but he's the one bloke. I'd, he'd probably be waiting at the end of our ride, but... Right now, it'd be Kerry Wilde and, and my grandfather, two two remarkable blokes that have been in my life and have taught me so much. Um, yeah, be those two. Beautiful. Well, thanks so much, Dan. Enjoy the rest of quarantine, and I'll uh, see you for some karaoke when you get out. Perfect. I'll hold you to that. Thanks, Taz. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast. I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or want to share with me what you've learned, email me at podcast at dietitianapproved.com. You can also spread the word by leaving me a review and taking a screenshot of you listening to the show. Don't forget to tag me on social media at dietitian.approved so I can give you a shout out too. If you want to learn more about what we do, head to dietitianapproved.com. And if you want to learn more about the Triathlon Nutrition Academy program, head to dietitianapproved.com forward slash academy. Thanks for joining me and I look forward to helping you smash it in the fourth leg. Nutrition! Nutrition!